what we have here is a Winchester 97. Okay, it's a 12-gauge shotgun. Now, when they were issued it to the Philippine scouts and to the constabulary, they came, most of them came with 30-inch barrels, which is the sporting barrels, because that's what the gun was designed for. It was designed for sport. During their experience in the Moro campaign, they realized that a shorter barrel would probably be handier, and eventually even Winchester made them with 20-inch barrels, and these became known as the riot model. And then in World War I, they put a heat shield on it and a bayonet, and it became what we call a trench gun. But they just called it the shotgun with bayonet and heat shield. But these were used by both the constabulary and the Philippine scouts. That's a 30 inch barrel. Mm -hmm. And let me just lay it on top here to give you an idea of what it would look like. You know. And there are photographs showing either constabulary. Okay, I'm trying to hold it on here, but give you an idea of what it would look like. Because there are photographs shown in Moro land of guys carrying these with the 30 inch barrel. Again. These were sporting guns that were then pressed into service for military use. The 30 inch barrel wouldn't be good for uh... birds. <laughs> well, it'd be good for birds, but it wouldn't be good for going into thick brush. Yes, that would probably be the, the problem. Forest, or, yeah. But on the other hand, if you compare it in length to, say, a Krag rifle or something, it's probably the same length. As a matter of fact, we'll do that right now. I'll overlay it on a Krag rifle. And you can see it would be roughly the same length as a, as a Krag rifle. Now, the reality is neither the constabulary or the scouts use Krag rifles except for one particular event, which I'll explain. But basically, it's, it's a long gun. Okay, when I started doing the research on the weapons of the Philippine scouts, one of the sites I went to was in the U.S. Army site, and it said that they used the trapdoor carbine and then went to the O3 and then the M1. So that is what I reported in part one of this series. And then I found pictures of them with crags, so I said, oops, they probably transitioned to the crags. So I had Chris put in a correction, and now I have to correct the correction. All right. The Philippine scouts used crags in two occasions, none of them in the, really in the field per se, well, one incident. But basically, we're gonna start over here and we're going to start off with the first firearm, which you couldn't see too well in the first part. And that is the Trapdoor Springfield in 4570. Now this particular model is a very early model, the 1873. Uh, chances are they would have had the later models, okay? This is the one that Custer and his men carried, okay? And it was an obsolete weapon. By the uh, time of the Spanish-American War, it was obsolete. But they're going to be issued to the Makebe, Makebebe, the Moros, and the first Philippine Scouts. And it's a black powder cartridge, single shot. They then transitioned in 1906, 1907. I have two uh, sources, so they're in conflict. Either 1906, 1907, they went to the O3, the U.S. Magazine Rifle, model 1903. This particular, it's commonly called the Springfield. This particular one was made at Rock Island Arsenal. But this was the basic infantry weapon of the United States Army from approximately 1905 to just before World War II. So the Philippine Scouts being part of the regular army, this was the weapon they would have trained in, particularly in the, in, during the period of the First World War, when the Philippine Scouts were in effect being prepared to go to Europe. And they were training, and then when the war suddenly ended, because they were originally going to be used in the Great Spring Offensive of 1919, which was designed to end the war, when of course the German government fell and the armistice was signed in November of 1918. So if you were a Philippine scout, you received the World War I Victory Medal, even though you didn't leave the Philippines. Now, the next gun that became the firearm of the Philippine Scouts is the M1 Garand rifle. Okay, this is an early model right here. You can tell by the sights it has the original locking bar. 
uh, minor differences is a little indentation in the clip here. Uh, the gas uh, cylinder is, is unfinished. And some of them even had what was called the gas port M1. Now, when the fighting started, the Springfield uses a five-shot stripper clip. And the 1917 Enfields used by the Commonwealth Army used five-shot stripper clips. And there were cases where members of the Philippine scouts received ammunition in five-shot stripper clips when you really needed ones in the M1 Grand clip. So they had to pull these out, stick them in the recover clips that they might have dropped on the battlefield. Otherwise, their M1 was a single shot. 20 years later, the same situation occurs at the Bay of Pigs when Brigade 2506 gets resupplied with Springfield ammunition in five-shot stripper clips, and they had to go and try to find expended clips and reload them. According to a recent article in the American Rifleman, some of the Philippine scouts traded their M1s to Navy personnel, whatever, to get Springfield because they felt more comfortable with it. It was a firearm they had used for many years. They preferred its accuracy, its reliability. So we do know that Philippine scouts were using O3 Springfields and M1 Garands. Now over here, I have the bayonet. This is your 1905 bayonet with the 1910 scabbard, which was designed originally for the O3. It was also issued with the M1. But if you were a Philippine scout, you might get a bolo bayonet. This is not a bolo bayonet. This is a U.S., you can see the serial number on the side. This was made in Springfield Armory in 1910. This is a bolo. There was a special bolo bayonet that would snap on the rifle. It had a handle similar to that, but a, but a bolo. Now, those are very, very rare in the United States, almost impossible to find. You're probably more likely to find them in the Philippines or in the footlocker of a former member of the Imperial Japanese Army than you are to find them at a gun show in the United States. And no one's made any reproductions of them yet. But the bolo bayonet was peculiar to the Philippine scouts and to the Filipinos' um, army. Uh, there are scenes in 1943 of Filipinos in the United States being given bolos similar to this because it's considered sort of a national weapon and a symbol of their independence and their culture. So this is a bolo, government issued bolo. Not a bolo bayonet, don't have one of those. Now over here, one of the issues that came up what people were talking about was the hand grenades. Now, the first World War I mark grenades were black, but some of them rusted, so people sometimes said, I thought I had a brown grenade. It has a shorter handle, this is an inert one, and after 20 years of storage, some of them didn't work. The U.S. grenade in the first part of the war was this color. This is an inert one, and during Guadalcanal, a lot of Marines complained that when they wore this on their web gear, uh, they became recipients of the Japanese Imperial Marksmanship Award, or the Purple Heart, because this showed up too well. So the order went out to dip them in green paint up to the top, leave a little yellow strip to indicate that they are explosive. But the Philippine scouts would have had either the black-bodied World War I Mark IIs or the newer yellow Mark II grenades. And here we have a Kelly helmet. That was a standard helmet of the Philippine Scouts. Okay, it's leather with a cloth chin strap. And it was the same one that was worn by the Marines on Wake Island and the U.S. Army at, on Bataan and Corregidor. And here we have the symbol of the Philippine Scouts. Okay, now. Let me explain how the crags come to play here. We have two crags here, a crag rifle and a crag carbine, all right? There are pictures of Makebe Bay carrying crags when they captured Aquinaldo. What you have to understand is that was a task force. The Makebe Bay were considered traitors by the other Filipinos for very good reason. They were loyal to Spain, and Spain had promised them that if the revolution succeeded, 
they would be relocated to what became known as the New Philippines or the Caroline Islands in the Pacific. They were loyal to Spain. When Spain left, they could not transfer their loyalty to the Filipinos because they were distrusted as much as, shall we say, Robert Rogers and the Queen's Own Rangers in the United States, you know, when, after the revolution. Now, Aquinaldo had talked with Admiral Dewey before Admiral Dewey came into the Philippines, and there was a misunderstanding over what would be the role of the Philippine revolutionaries should the United States overthrow Spain. Now, Aquinaldo was living in Hong Kong on a pension from Spain that he had agreed to basically stop the revolution. Now, he was going to return, and he was under the impression the United States would then turn over the Philippines to him and his revolutionary movement. Well, decisions were made in Washington contrary to that, and we have what's called the Philippine Insurrection. They realized that Aquinaldo was the key to the revolution. If you capture him, you'll probably dismantle the movement. So the Makebe Bay, who were loyal to the United States, were put together and created a special band of Tagalog-speaking Makebe Bay. They took away their trapdoors. They were given Spanish Mausers, Krag rifles, and Spanish rolling blocks. And what they did is they created what's known as a pseudo-gang. In other words, what appeared to be a part of the Revolutionary Army. And under Frederick Funston, they had captured a courier who was bringing messages from Aquinaldo to another revolutionary. They forged papers and notified Aquinaldo that they were coming as the reinforcements he had requested. And that they had had a battle with the Americans, had killed two Americans, wounded two and captured three. And they were bringing the captured Americans along with their guns, the crags, and other guns, Spanish Mausers, to reinforce Aquinaldo. They then arrived at his base, shot his guards, and grabbed him. And then when they returned, they turned in their crags, their Spanish Mausers, and they went back to the trapdoors. So there are pictures of Makebe Bay with Aquinaldo carrying crags, but that was a, a task force, a special mission. They basically created what the British used to call a pseudo-gang, which they used in Kenya and Malaya, where you have make-believe revolutionaries in order to infiltrate. The Marines also used that technique in Haiti against a guy named Charlemagne, where Marines made believe that they were captured by rebels, went to Charlemagne's camp, and killed him. Now, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. In Haiti, they put Charlemagne's face on postage stamps and they build statues to him. <laughs> I don't think they do that to the Marines in Haiti. Okay. Now, the Crag Carbine there, that's an interesting story all by itself. In 18, 1903, St. Louis was going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. So many people wanted to set up at this thing that they made it the 1904 World's Fair. And part of the World's Fair was a 47-acre exhibit of how the United States was civilizing the Philippines. Included in that exhibit were native troops. They were Philippine scouts and constabulary. When they arrived, they took away their obsolete trapdoors gave them crag carbines. No ammunition, but they gave them crag carbines. So they could march around at the end of every day to be a big parade, and the Philippine scouts and the constabulary with their white officers would march down the street waving their American flag. And then at the exhibit itself, we were trying to propagandize how we had civilized the Philippines. And the, the event that's most remembered from that particular World's Fair is the dog eating. They got a tribe from the Philippines, the Ergot, who would eat dog the way we eat turkey and on special occasions. But since the crowd loved it so much, they had dog every day. And of course, where did they get the dogs? We don't know. But every day, they would put on an exhibit and they would have a dog feast. 
And this was used to show how, through American influence, we were taking these primitive people and bringing them to modern civilization. And they were in port shop stuff. Okay? So what they would do is they would have different villages representing the Philippines mm -hmm. and then showing different groups of people and at the end were the, the educated Filipinos. And then they opened up a school and they would send the kids from those primitive tribes to the school. And that was part of the exhibit. Now, the famous picture of Philippine scouts with bolo drill, that's what's laying next to them. Each of them has a crag carbine. Meanwhile, back in the Philippines, <laughs> the constabulary and the scouts were fighting in the jungles with this. They carried this obsolete gun. But in 1904, for the show and tell at the World's Fair, they're marching around with crags, and they were given brand new American Army uniforms, brand new leather ammunition pouches, everything. It was a giant show and tell, the dog and pony show with the dog show being separate. But um, that explains why we have pictures of scouts with crags. In the field, they went from the trapdoor carbine to the O3 to the M1. The presentation I'm going to give you is on the Philippine Scouts. I, I did a lot of research and a lot of myths that I, I believed in too. I found out were myths. And it's going to be uh, some information on the equipment and, and the history. I want you to think back to Yorktown. Imagine if at Yorktown, you're George.